Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next session of Security by Alive. I am joined here by Dr. Maria Bell, a South Dakota based surgeon who has used digital twin imaging technology in performing over 5,000 robotic surgeries. However, it wasn't until the Uvalde school shooting happened when she decided to refocus her energies into deploying 3D imaging technology to assist first responders in gaining full access to public buildings to help apply a surgical approach to school safety. We're here today to discuss how this innovative use of LIDAR technology is helping contribute towards tackling the challenging issue of school safety. Dr. Bell, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, just to start us off, could you please just provide the audience with a little background into who you are and why you're here today? Yes, thank you. Uh, I am a gynecologic oncologist, so I take care of women with female reproductive cancers. I do their surgery as well as chemotherapy. I started robotic surgery in 2005 and have done about 5,000 surgeries using 3D technology. So I am immersed in that technology all the time. So I'm, I'm comfortable in that space. Um, and that's why I felt um, that, you know, that I could start this company with a reasonable amount of uh, expertise. So, so you started your company, Digital Twin Imaging, just over a year ago, if that's correct. And, and what was the original intention of this technology? So initially, I was looking at trying to um, develop some medical applications for the metaverse. And so in order to get real objects into the metaverse, you need sophisticated equipment. And that's what I invested in. And my thought was, we will develop medical applications. So I became very familiar with the sophisticated technology and uh, hired a young, bright associate who is a computer whiz. And we went about learning all about the technology. And, and, and this, term, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. ahead. I'll say, and this technology that you're referring to, is that the light detection and, rad and ranging, so LIDAR, in effect, scanning technology? Absolutely. And it's used in a lot of industries. You're probably most familiar with it in the retail industry. But what's um, amazing about the more sophisticated you get into the technology is the amount of information that you can actually put into the model. And so that's where really the uh, the magic happens is what you put into the model. I was going to say, typically, when I think of LIDAR, I automatically think of, you know, the automotive industry. So, you know, the sensors on my car um, or in, in obviously the security space in commercial perimeters, uh, protect commercial perimeter protection that seems like a bit of a mouthful um <laughs> and um so could you just give us a brief overview of what this technology actually does in terms of an overarching theme of what its intention is well it basically it gives you a 360 view of whatever you know building you're in and it can also scan outdoors um it's easier to do it indoors um with the current technology and then it's um it's the information that you can put into it. You can basically put any picture, uh, URL, video um, into the model to give information to the people that are accessing the model. And what was it that made you think that this could be applied into a school safety setting? So we initially had scanned a church here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and into the model put lots of information about um, the history of the church, and for instance, the stained glass windows, who was the artist, what was it depicting, that type of stuff. And the church posted it on their website, and people from all over the country who grew up in this area gave them fantastic you know, feedback about, wow, I didn't know all that information about the church, and it was really cool. And so the Catholic schools saw that we had done that, and they wanted us to do something similar for the schools for marketing purposes. And at that time is when Uvalde, Texas, and the tragedy that occurred at Robb Elementary School occurred. And I watched the um, the television, uh, you know, of the first responders standing outside of the school for over an hour. And it was complete chaos. And I thought to myself, well, I don't think they knew anything about the interior of the school. And that's exactly right. And so that was the aha moment where I thought, wow, maybe we could scan schools and put first responder information into that. 
So once you had this this brainwave, uh, you met with Dickinson County Sheriff. Um, and how did you convince him to actually start to trial this technology into a school building? So I contacted him and sent him the church model. So he was able to navigate it quite easily. And he's not a very tech savvy person. So I posed him the question, if I scan a school and put first responder information into it, did he think that would be helpful? And he did. So he asked us to scan a school in Dickinson County and put first responder information into it. Um, they had already um, scheduled a meeting with school administrators and first responders. So we were asked to present the model, which we did. And they were all wowed, like, why hasn't this been out there before? And uh, that's how we started. And 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 when you say first responders, it's not just policing, is it? It's also fire safety in that respect as well. Absolutely. It's for fire and rescue, paramedics, um, police, SWAT. So all of those um, disciplines can use the model. Um, but in addition, there's some more versatility, which um, the school administrators like. For instance, our school administrator likes to use it for recruitment of faculty. So when he's at a trade show and trying to recruit new um, new teachers, he shows them this model of the school, which is very impressive. Um, he uses it to uh, talk to students that might be transferring into that school district. So the parents and the student can actually walk through the school virtually. Um, he does it for orientation of new faculty or new custodial employees. So there are a lot of other functions to the model other than security. It's definitely a multifaceted technology then. Um, and could you explain to us that uh, just briefly the, the process of implementing this technology into the school? You know, what was the training involved? How long did it take? What was the response from the school, as you said already? You know, fantastic. But also from the first responders. So the process is um, we have our technicians go to the school. The school needs to be um, empty of people. So it's on holiday or at night that we scan the school. And it takes about 25 hours to scan a 150,000 square foot building. And then it's about another 25 hours to edit it and get all the information that is needed into the model. Then we actually physically go back to the school and walk through the school with a first responder as well as the school principal to make sure that everything has been entered correctly. Uh, in addition, we actually have uh, first responder training so that they understand how to use the model um, and, of course, do orientation with the uh, school principal and the faculty. I mean, when you think of it, 22 to 25 hours of of recording an entire school sounds like a laborious um, um, time. But actually, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's virtually nothing for the kind of lifetime of. Well, obviously, until the school might get changed or whatever. Sure. But, uh, you know, the lifetime of benefit that that can actually provide the school environment. Um, so that's quite incredible that you can do all of that in, in such a short period of time. And, um, and and LIDAR, like you said, like all technologies, is continuously evolving. So how, how has it grown since that first adoption in, in school? So we hired our own software engineer to add additional functionality to the model that our first responders were requesting. For instance, when you go into a building or into the model, if you make a couple of turns, you become disoriented as far as direction. So... Um, we have a software engineer that's designing a real-time compass that will guide you as to which direction you're facing anytime. Uh, additionally, we are having um, a beacon placed in the model. For instance, if a dispatcher has good information on where a shooter is, they can put it into the model, which will be deployed to all the first responders who have the model and they don't have to refresh their screens or anything like that. So it's giving them real-time information. Um, additionally, we have the ability to deploy the model. Um, we did a, a training session where first responders, as they approached the venue, we had a geofenced area. And once they crossed the line, the uh, school model was deployed 
to their iPhone or Android or tablet, whatever they're using in their squad car. And then they could, you know, get the model right, right then and there. Prior to this, the technology, so to speak, that they were using was um, a 2D laminated picture of this, you know, building with very little information and they never really used it at all. So um, that's what we're currently using. Additional functionality will be um, when um, a, a room or a hallway is cleared, which is the technical term that SWAT uses, so that they make sure that that area has been cleared by their team and there's no bad guy there. Um, we can depict that in the model in real time, which helps during the crisis, but also after the crisis. They'll usually have some sort of debriefing and they can use the model. All of the first responders can be sitting together and walk through the school and kind of reenact the actual crisis and what happened. And that allows them to see what went well, but maybe things that didn't go so well, and um, so that they know that they can improve the next time. And, and interesting you say that, because I was actually going to ask, you know, out of curiosity in terms of training post-emergency or, or um, you know, it, when they're walking through the school, for example, could that be adopted into a kind of virtual reality-like training uh, for future? Absolutely. So right now uh, we are having some young interns from our local college um, come in and actually work with the model to make it more of an interesting way to train. Um, I didn't realize this, but most first responders have never been in the school to which they are dispatched. So they have no idea. They've never been in that school. And this way they can become familiar with the building. And we're going to uh, use some video gaming technology to make it more interesting for the first responders to actually go into the school and do the training. And and would that be in in three DOF or six DOF? Do you know? So would they be able to move around in 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 the reality and, and walk, for example? Or is it, you know, you're you're all sitting in a classroom watching a screen and learning together? They could do it either way. If you put on an Oculus, you can actually walk through the school. So that's very cool. Yeah. That that sounds that sounds incredible, and and once you scan a building, um, you know what type of information is included in the facility map, and and where would you store it? So it's stored in the cloud um, and accessible to whomever has the password. Um, we can depict things that would be standard exits, where AED units are, fire extinguishers the main valve for water, gas, et cetera. Those are pretty easy things to, to do. Um, uh, what we also embed into it is a sky view, which is um, a drone view of the school um, with geographic markings to help with orientation as a first responder who comes into an area where they have never been. They'll know street names, et cetera. Um, those are the main things that I can think of. So, so you mentioned how it's it's readily available or accessible with anyone with a password. Is that something that would be distributed to, like you said, fire services, police, etc., um, before an emergency or during an emergency? Yes. So they would have access to it twenty four seven. But during an emergency, the emergency dispatch command center would be able to deploy it to all the first responders that need it at the time of the crisis, which is really, you know, the proprietary thing about it. Yeah, I mean, there's no one trying to get on the phone to find out the blueprints of a building in the middle, in the exactly. middle of the crisis. Exactly. And um, and just another thing to hover on is, is what are the benefits of storing it in the cloud? Is it the accessibility that and is the, the core reason yeah. I've done this? Yeah. Yeah. It's also the security too. So it's mm -hmm. accessibility, but the actual security. And I believe you're also joined here today with your colleague, Elliot Barnes, who uh, I'm assuming is a reference to the tech whiz he said earlier, um, <laughs> and because he heads up your tech services for DTI. Um, and he's going to provide us a product demonstration or a little insight into how we can fully understand the depths of this technology. So we'll just pause for a second here. And uh, I, for one, am very excited to see exactly how this technology works. So take it away when you're ready, Elliot. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, my name is Elliot Barnes. I'm the VP of uh, Technical Services for DTI. 
and I kind of handle the day-to-day -day operations and production of our 3D models. So uh, hopping into the model here, uh, I'll just briefly go around and kind of show you a few of the, the uh, different key assets that we input within the models here. Um, so right at the beginning, uh, you can see that we've entered all of the unique locks that can be found throughout the building. And this allows locksmiths on SWAT teams to uh, have this quick information and then relay back to their commander and give them a rough estimate on how long it'll take them to breach through a specific type of door. Um, next to that, we have what we call our sky view. And this sky view is actually an overhead image showing the interior and exterior uh, of that building. Um, and within this view here, we've actually overlaid it so that you can see um, all of those interior interior details, um, as well as uh, parking lots, uh, labeling, street names, uh, fire hydrants, and then also uh, line, lines going out in 100 foot increments. Um, so if there's ever a hazardous emergency, at a quick glance of this view here, uh, the commander can easily see how far away uh, 300 feet maybe from the edge of the building. And then kind of following off of that is a second version of our sky view. And this one actually has a lower opacity floor plan to it. That way this leaves the roof elements exposed so that uh, firefighters or the SWAT team or police officers can see um, all of those elements on top of that roof. Um, say there's a fire in a in a building and there's a 20,000 pound AC unit above that room. Um, with a quick glance here, they can see that that room may need to be a priority over others, uh, just in case it were to collapse. And then hopping back into the model here, uh, you can see that we've also marked all entrances and exits into the building, as well as all fire alarm panels, fire extinguishers, uh, labeling of all room numbers, um, any areas of notice such as uh, roof access or doors that were obstructed during the time of scanning, um, just because those could change with time. So we wanted to make sure that the responders uh, knew that it uh, it might be a, a different, they may have to take a different approach um, if they were going that direction. Uh, so we've also labeled all major utility valves, uh, such as electrical main shutoffs, uh, water shutoffs, gas shutoffs, um, sprinkler shutoffs, everything along those lines. Um, in addition to that, we've also marked all uh, network hardware rooms, security camera rooms, um, and then kind of going down the line here, you can see that you can select your different floors within the model. Um, so the only basement within this one here was their orchestra pit. Um, and then on the upper floor was the balcony of their performing arts center, as well as a few mechanical rooms. And then going to the right of that is uh, another tool here. This is the uh, measurement tool. And this allows the user to place measurements within the model that are accurate within a centimeter. Um, so if there needs, if there's a discussion about hose length for a firefighter, or um, if there's a sniper on a SWAT team and they need to know a specific distance within the school, um, they can get that inform information quickly and easily here with the measurement tool. And then a couple more features here I want to show you. Uh, one would be the search bar. Uh, so say there was an incident in room 312 and the officer needed to know where that room was because um, as of right now, there's quite a bit of information on the screen here. Um, so by searching 312, that actually hides all of the other digital assets within the model and singles out the room 312 label. Uh, that way from there, they can plan out a, a quickest route to that room so that they can deal with the emergency as quickly as possible. And then uh, one final thing here is the different layers that we have. So we have a, a separate layer for each department of public safety. And this allows them to get the information that they need and, and hide information that 
uh, could be distracting or take more time to find. So for example, uh, EMS, paramedics, they don't need, they don't necessarily need the information of uh, all the fire extinguishers and utility valves. Um, mostly they would just need entrances and exits. So within the, the EMS layer here, we've kind of hidden all of the other information. And then going to fire and police, their uh, responsibilities kind of are, are much broader in a way. So they need more of that information within the model here. So within the fire and police layers, uh, we've made sure to include more of that information. And then as far as uh, navigation throughout the model, you can see that it's a, a very immersive experience. It mixes 360 photography with uh, 3D data. Um, so it's what is called a point cloud. And um, our scanners actually send out millions of points um, throughout the scan. And each one of those points holds a, an RGB code as well as depth data. And that's what actually builds out the physical 3D model um, and here you can see just the raw data um, that's collected from those scanners. So thank you for taking the time to let me demonstrate this model here. And uh, back to you, Dr. Bell and Rebecca. Thank you, Elliot. That was absolutely fascinating. I can't believe how much information you can actually gain from that type of technology. It's it's slightly mind blowing. And, um, and back to you, Dr. Bell. Um, at the moment, this technology is primarily, like you said, in, in use for school safety when it comes to intrusion or active shooter situations. But can this be adopted in any building? And what does it look like on a mass scale for the future? So yes, it can be incorporated into any uh, building. Tip, right now we're looking at government buildings, schools, and churches. Those are what we consider soft targets that um, you know bad people can get at entry into fairly easily. So that's what we're concentrating on currently. And and do you think this? kind of project obviously um in terms of you know terrorism for example in, in government buildings and church and hate crimes um will start to be deployed out throughout not just the states but also you know internationally on on in obviously in the grand scheme of things in the future it's still you know fairly it's, young yeah certainly i think it has application worldwide at, at, you know absolutely um Right now, obviously, we're we have a provisional patent in the United States. We will be applying for an international patent, and uh, hopefully, we can uh, you know go abroad. And and you strike me as someone who always wants to push the boundaries of innovation, discover more. And this technology can already pinpoint you know every exit, window, door, hallway, dustbin, um, absolutely anything. And and but where do you think this will develop next? What are, what are the boundaries or are there any boundaries? I, I don't think we even know what we can do with it currently. Um, you know, the, the software, the technology is changing so quickly. Um, for instance, the, you know, Google Eyewear never made much success because people didn't want to be looking at the Internet all day. But first responders are going to want to look at that model when they're in a building and be hands free. That's probably the biggest um, you know, problem at this point is that it's, you know, requiring them to look at their phone. But there's eyewear out there, I'm sure, soon to be had that we could combine with our technology so that they could do hands-free uh, moving through the model. And and you mentioned that, you know, the, the uh, you know, first responder on scene having to, uh, you know, stop for a second, look at their phone. Uh, do, is that usually fundamentally run through like an incident commander, for example, who might be deploying through, you know, critical communications to the, you know, the responders in the ground in the school, mm -hmm. for example? Yeah. So um, what they have done is dispatch is in their office looking at the model. Um, in the trial that we ran, the first responders had 60 seconds to refresh, um, you know, the view. And then they were timed from entry into the school until they placed simulation rounds into the target. Um, but there's a couple of ways they can do it. They can have a three person team where the middle individual is actually looking at the model and then the one behind and in front is carrying the weapons. Um, also dispatch is in radio communications with the first responders that are in the field. So they, they're, they're talking back and forth and that's really how it worked 
Um, and so that's how we've been utilizing it up, up until now. And you mentioned just then, sorry, that the, in the trial they were timed. What was the time difference between the trial um, of them finding, you know, the active shooter, for example, and that original, you know, news broadcast that you watch on TV that, that you know, brought on all of this? So um, the SWAT team that we worked with had teams that basically were told that there was an active shooter in an elementary school. And those teams were timed from the time that they entered the school until they put simulation rounds into the target. And their average time was seven minutes and 30 seconds. So the teams that had access to our 3D model and knew what the room number was were able to do that in 31 seconds. Wow. So a, a staggering difference, mm -hmm. to be quite honest, and something that is it's slightly mind blowing and, and clearly has a, a, a core and fundamental reason for this technology to be to be readily available and to start to actually you know roll out into into schools, into government builders, into all of that. So it's really exciting journey, I think. Um, before we wrap up this session, is there anything else that you wanted to add before we go? Um, just maybe how they could get a hold of us. I, I don't know if you're going to be yeah. putting anything there, but just uh, DTI uh, sim .com. Perfect. Well, thank you, Dr. Bell and Elliot for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and see innovation in, in its infancy stage. New technologies like this absolutely pioneer the way for the future. And I'm so glad that we have all witnessed what I'm sure is only the beginning. Um, if you'd like to find out more, obviously, please do not hesitate to reach out to Dr. Bell or Elliot on the platform to connect and be part of this innovation. So thank you for watching and thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you.